Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to this tutorial. And I just wanted to put together a quick video to show you guys how to deploy your own OpenVPN access servers. And the point of this is so that you can use the vSphere client from a remote location, so not on your home network, to safe and securely control your ESXi server without directly exposing it to the public internet by opening up firewall rules unnecessarily. So again, rather than doing that, we're going to create this OpenVPN access server and you'll then create a VPN tunnel onto your home network and you'll be able to use your vSphere client as if you were sitting on your home network even though you'll end up being in a remote location. So to begin with, um, we need to go to this very long URL, but rather than typing all of that out, if you just go to Google and you type in OpenVPN Access Server ESXi and search, it should be the first link that comes up. So if you click on that, and you should see a page that looks like this with the following two links. We want to choose one of them depending on whether you want 64 or 32-bit. So in my case, I use the 64-bit install. And keep this page open because later on we're going to reference these question and answer sections here, or explanation sections rather, as we start to actually configure it. So once that downloads, go ahead and open up your vSphere client. And I'm just going to use a series of screenshots that I took earlier. But what you want to do is go up to File in the vSphere client and select this option here for deploy OVF template and then on that screen that comes up go to browse and now just find the file that we downloaded in the previous screen select open and then move on so the next screen is just going to show you some basic information you can click next here it asks us for a name for this virtual machine that it's going to create and by default I left it with what they suggest, but you can rename it if you want. So now we have to select which data store we want to use. And if you only have one hard drive, you probably only have one data store, so you can just make sure you have enough space and deploy it on there. Otherwise, in my situation, I have two, so I selected my secondary. So here it's telling me how much space I have available on there and some options. I just left the default, so move to the next. And here I just left this tick box empty and click finish. Here it's going to deploy, so give it, um, you know, maybe a minute or two and it should deploy that. So once it finishes there, go ahead and right click it, go to power and select power on. And once you see this green triangle pop up, that means that the server is actually running. So you can go up here to this icon and this is going to open up a console in a separate window. And you should see eventually something like this line right here come up. You can disregard all of this. This is from a previous run that I did. But in order to log in, you need to use their default username and password, which is username is root and the password is openvpnas. So you put that in and the first screen you'll be presented with asks you to select yes or no to agree to their terms and conditions. So type out the word yes and hit enter. And now here we start the series of questions and answers that we have to do for the configuration. So this is where I told you to just keep open that web page because here we have all of these questions that they're going to be asking us and an explanation for what exactly they're getting at with each one. So you can reference those if you want. Um, by default, I'll just give you the answers I used. And if you're okay with the default, you don't even need to type out yes. In this case, you could have just hit enter. Um, I typed out the word yes just to show you you can. So for the first question, um, this will be my primary access node. So I selected yes. I hit enter. The next question presents you with two options. And in my situation, I knew I had access to this Ethernet 0 interface. So I selected option 2. If you're uncertain... You can go ahead and use option number one for all interfaces. For the specific port number for the admin web UI, I chose to use the default 943. You probably shouldn't have any issue with that. 
So you can just hit enter to skip that or change it if you really need to. Um, for the TCP port for OpenVPN daemon, this is going to listen on port 443 for client connections by default. Now, this is also the default port for SSL communication on things like Apache. So I had an issue where this would have conflicted. And rather than deal with that, I just chose to change this by default on mine. So, for example, you could change this to something like port um, 4443. This way it's a little easier to remember, or you can just use the default if you're not really worried about any conflicts later on. Should all client traffic be routed by default through the VPN? I selected yes. And then here, should client DNS traffic also be routed through the VPN? I also selected yes. And now I just put these screenshots with the explanation in the background to kind of show you what's going on a little bit better, but you can also reference that web page. Use local authentication via the internal database. The default is no, but I chose to use yes. Now the explanation says basically that if we choose no, if we use the default, then you have to go ahead and set up um, password authentication using Linux. So you need to set up users and passwords inside of the Linux operating system itself, not the OpenVPN access server. So rather than deal with all of that, I just chose to select yes here, and I'm going to use an internal database to the OpenVPN access server and allow that to handle my user authentication. Here it's asking, should private subnets be accessible to clients by default um, on this? And I chose yes. Here, uh, initially, you need to log into the admin web UI. So you need a username and a password to do that. They have a default username, which is given to everybody. This is the same on all installations. So I chose no here, and I chose to actually change this. So I typed in no and hit enter. And the next question that it gave me then was to specify a name for the user account. So go ahead and just select some kind of a name that you want to use to access it. Then it'll ask you for your password twice. And finally, you'll get to this question about a license key. Now, you can just hit enter and leave this blank. But just to clarify, by default, the free license without inserting a key gives you access to two clients at one time. So you can have two simultaneous client connections using the VPN at any one time. So if you close one off, you can then open up a separate one from a different machine. It just means two concurrently at one time. In order to expand beyond that, you need to pay them for each license. And the last I checked, it was, I believe, $6 per license per year, and a minimum of 10 licenses had to be purchased. So really, you're looking at $60 a year for 10 clients. But by all means, for what we're doing, the basic two client license should be good enough. So I'll just keep that. And then after that runs, everything should come out. It'll tell you how you can access the admin and client using this port number. So you just want to note that it's HTTPS, the IP address and the port number there, slash admin. So what we're going to do is open up our browser and type in HTTPS, this whole segment. So it might be a little different for you, but make sure that you put the colon 943 slash admin. You'll get this user name and password prompt. So go ahead and put in the username and password that you specified. You have to agree to their licensing conditions. And then finally, we'll have access to the admin UI. So here again, it just says you're licensed for two users and it gives you some more information and here you can start to configure your VPN access server for networking and all different configurations that you might want. And so finally we now need to access this using some kind of a client. Now depending on what kind of an operating system you're going to be running the client from, you want to choose from this URL one of these four options. So if you're on a Mac, you would use this. For Linux, this. 
and for Windows you have two options. You can use this which is available in a web browser so you can authenticate through the web browser directly or we can use their application which is a, a specific standalone client application in Windows. And this is the option that I'm going to be using. So once we download and install that, um, it will, if you open it, give you this kind of an interface and you can put the address to your open VPN access server. So in my case, it was this private address. Connect, and now you need to put in your username and password, select login. Now it'll ask you for accepting a untrusted security certificate. In this case, you can go ahead and either do always or this time only. You can probably get away with always. This time, you might use if you were logging in from, let's say, a friend's computer or some other computer that you wouldn't regularly use. So you just do it this one time. And either way, you'll get to this screen, hopefully, that says you are connected. This is the IP address of the OpenVPN access server. This is your new client IP address. So this is the IP address that your machine is being addressed to through the VPN tunnel. And this is the amount of traffic in and out since you've connected. So at this point, um, it's kind of redundant because I'm already sitting on this same private network on the same subnet. So I'm really not gaining anything by doing this, but it ensures that everything is working properly from at least inside the network. And again, I'll just mention that we have a maximum of two simultaneous client connections at one time. So if this is running and we went and fired it up on our laptop and then we tried to access it from a third laptop, we would run into an issue because that's three concurrent connections. So we'd have to disconnect from one of these first before moving to that third client. And that pretty much covers everything to that point, but if we wanted to actually access this from outside of our network, we have to do a little bit more. So one thing you can do is go to Google and just type in what's my IP and your public address should be listed right at the top in Google search and just take note of that if you don't have your own domain name you can use that and just note that that might change kinda of often depending on how your um, ISP does leasing from your router so if you lose power for example you might actually lose that IP address and you would have to take note of a new IP address. At any rate, take note of that public IP address. Maybe you want to store it in your phone or something for um, later reference if you can't remember it. And what you have to do now is log into your router and assuming you're on the same private IP address as myself, what you would do is 192.168.1.1 and this would give you an interface to log in to whatever your router is. So in my case, I have Verizon Fios, so I would log in with my username and password. And I would open up a port forwarding rule that just said any connections coming in on ports, in my case 4443, is going to be sent to that OpenVPN access server. So anything coming in on port 4443 is going to be redirected to 192.168.1.8 in this situation. And so the way we would use that, if I were to go ahead and open this up again, is uh, I'm just making this up. I don't remember exactly my public IP address, but let's say it was... let's say it looked something like that um, since I changed the default I have to specify what port I'm going to be using so I would put 4443 um, if you didn't change that initial port number that it was listening on you can just leave that empty right there so I would do this from outside of my network and connect and that would attempt to make a connection and go through. Now, this I've tested does work from outside of my network. The only time that I had a problem was using Android, uh, I'm sorry, my Android phone on 
the Verizon 4G LTE network. And it turns out that the way 4G LTE works, at least on Verizon's network, is that you are assigned a private IP address behind a separate router. So essentially they're doing what's known as network address translation. And because of this, essentially you have a double NAT and that doesn't allow you to receive the connection information back from the server if you're using the Android app or if you have a computer that's tethered through a Verizon 4G LTE device. So that might pose an issue for you, but this should work otherwise if you're connected, let's say, at a Starbucks or at an airport or a hotel. This should give you no trouble. Um, and now, so once you've connected that client for OpenVPN, you can go ahead and launch your vSphere client, and now you'll be able to access your ESXi server as if you were connected directly in your home network. And again, that's going to use an encrypted tunnel, so all of your connection information is going to be sent securely directly to your network and then onto that ESXi server. So hopefully that all made sense and you were able to follow along. And um, thanks for watching.